We're going to conclude our study on sin tonight. Doesn't mean we're going to ever stop talking about sin. Okay, we are reminded of it all the time. Uh, but really, you, you see the title up here, and you may think, well, I know Romans 6.23, that's the penalty of sin. Well, we're going we're gonna to go into more scriptural details here. Um, I read a very good illustration, and I want to share that illustration with you, is uh, by Dr. Mark Cameron, who's since passed away. He doesn't have any, any sin anymore. <laughs> He's in heaven now. Uh, but he made a very good comparison about the action of sin and then the natural consequences. If you have a chance, go online, search Bible Doctrines by Mark Cameron, and you will find a PDF of that whole book. And I, would str I strongly suggest that you download it and save it and start reading it. It's a wonderful study. He goes through all these different things. I've taught about four sections already. We're, this is the fourth one on, uh, on we're doing sin now. We talked about soteriology, which is salvation, and we've talked about the Holy Spirit. I've used his material because what's wonderful about it is it's just verses. He just presents verses and, and sets the context properly. So it's very educational. There's not a lot of theory and all this different things going on in philosophy. It's just Bible, and that's, that's really good. But he gave a very good illustration of what sin is. There's a natural consequence for sin. And we've looked at that, the extent and realm and all these different things. I've, uh, throughout this series, you've looked at what Christian science says about sin, which I think is probably the most unique view of all the religions out there, which is you're actually just deceiving yourself into thinking you're sinful. You haven't actually committed something. You're just not living the right way. Christian science, when it was first founded, says there are no sick believers you just think you're sick. A lot of dead Christian scientists who just think they're dead. Okay? Like, <laughs> stop thinking that, you know? Uh, it's illogical. Well, but, and it's because they're not basing it off of the truth of God's word. But a very good example here is when a child is told not to eat of a certain type of food. Let's just say cookies, right? Because if you eat too many cookies as a little kid, your stomach is going to send out uh, what is not needed, and you get sick, and that's the natural consequence. You were given instructions not to do something, you disobeyed, and now you have consequences for that. Well, we're going to look tonight at the penalty of sin to the furthest extent. We looked at how sin last week affects the natural kingdom. We looked at how it affects mankind. Uh, sin has affected heaven. It, is affected, it has affected man's relationship and man's walk with God. We are born into this world spiritually dead. Okay, and this is why it's so important to recognize what Jesus Christ did. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the name Jordan B. Peterson. He's a very prominent speaker to young men today. I think he wrote a book called 12 Steps for Life, and it was very well received. Uh, he's under attack all the time. But just recently, I was looking at some of the material that he put out. And he says, why I do not believe in God. And he quoted about a, or he clipped about a two-minute uh, clip from one of his speaking engagements. And in this, he's a very wordy guy. Have you ever met people like that? Or you've listened to people like that? I mean, they make podcasts all the time. And you can get so, like, wooed by that. You're just, wow, this guy's so deep. You know, he thinks about the very deep things. But throughout this two-and-a-half-minute clip, he makes one statement. He says, you know, we, we shouldn't just simply believe. We should fight and fight and fight for the truth because, you know, God's an infinite being, and we are separated from him by death. And I immediately in that moment, I was like, that's why we should listen to what Jesus said. Okay, because he came back from the dead. Who else do we want to base our truth off of than someone who has actually done it? Okay, and he came back. And there's so many verses in support of that, but he's the last person that people look at. He'll be the last person that people look at. And, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see where people are, where the world is. You have God's wisdom, and then you have man's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 does a wonderful job of comparing those two, okay? Um, it, you know, by foolishness, preaching is, is, is how the word gets out. Well, it's not foolishness to God, but to man, I'm a fool. You're a fool. We're all just here in a procedure to deaden ourselves from the reality of one day we're just going to be annihilated. It's all going to be over. And the Bible doesn't teach that. 
Okay, so of course the natural penalty of sin is, I want you to write these things down, it's disease, disappointment, and physical death. Okay? I know many of you, there's, if we were to just take a poll of how many of you have been affected by cancer yourself or someone close to you, there'd be over 90% of the hands up. I lost my mother early in my life to cancer, my grandmother the same way. Um, those things were not the, a part of the original plan. That's not how God designed the world. Okay, natural disasters, all those different things are a product of the penalty for sin. Disappointment, too, and also uh, physical death. But then there's a positive penalty, and I don't mean this as in a, yay, a good thing, but it's a progressive penalty in regards to sin. And there's seven points under this, and that's where we're going to have the, uh, the bulk of our teaching tonight. The first thing is, of course, up there on the screen, separation. Had a great question come in on Bible Line, and we talked about this very thing. A young man sent a question, and he said, I don't want to sound dense, but, you know, Jesus died on the cross to pay for me, but I still die. What, why do I still die? It's an excellent question. Why do we still die? Well, take a look at the screen up there, and you'll see why. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So yes, one of the penalties of sin is death, but there has been an answer by God for that separation. When you and I die, we do not cease to exist. Okay, There's actually no place in the Bible where that is ever taught, annihilation or complete destruction. Let me give you an example of annihilation and complete destruction. It goes against the law of the universe. Energy can't be destroyed. You know, if you really think about this, and I'm going out on a limb trying to explain this because I am not the most educated person on scientific things, but let me just explain this to you. God has not created anything that is temporary. You think about that for a moment. He deals only in the eternal. Now, our bodies were designed to go on forever. But because of sin, now everything decays. I watched a video today. I was waiting for files to transfer up there. And you know, if you're, filing, if you're transferring files on a computer and you're moving, like I was moving 60 gigs, it was about a 10-minute wait time. Well, I got on YouTube, and one of the suggested videos was a four-minute video of the decay of a watermelon. And I thought, who's making this stuff? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're producing quality content. Why, you know, what if I deny God? Uh, can I lose my salvation? 100 views, 200 views. Decaying watermelon, 5.4 million. I mean, that's where people are at. Anyway, I watched this video. I was just another view, okay? <laughs> like, I, I watched this video, and it was amazing to see. I had this full watermelon, and over the process of two years, at least that's what the video said, the days were so long, you just saw it really collapse in on itself, and then the mold happened, and then the mold kind of came into something else to where this giant watermelon, which is about the size of a volleyball, was just a flat piece of skin. It was amazing to see. But I've been preparing for this message, and I thought, that is, that's the product of sin right there. Decay. If you were to stoop down and eat that, you would get sick, probably gravely ill. That's not a part of God's process. But God doesn't create anything that is temporary because the soul that is within you and me, that will live on forever. Even for the person that spends an eternity in hell separated from God, they will have a body there where the worm dieth not. We don't talk about hell enough. It's a real place. That track that you pull out of your pocket and give to somebody has so much more importance if you think about hell and what's going on there. And so we can see that, the, and when God makes a new heaven and the new earth, it's going to continue on into eternity, and you and I can't even fathom that. Try that when you go home. Think about forever, and you'll get, you will probably get scared. It's unnatural to you and me. There's start and end, end points. You know, even the best meal in the world, at some point, you have to stop eating it. You know what I'm saying? But man, I can't wait to be in a state where I will not care about forever because I'll be with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful stuff? 
all available by simply taking God at his word. But we're talking about death here, and it's not annihilation, it's not complete destruction. It is separation. When you and I die, that body and soul are separated, and if you're in the rapture, you get to skip that. You will be transformed into your new body. But for those who have already gone on, their soul is separated from their body. And if they have a spirit that is the new nature, they go to heaven. If not, they go to the heart of the earth, where they will be there until the day of judgment. They'll be brought forward, and they'll have to give an account. So two types of separation here. The first one, spiritual death, Ephesians 2.1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then we have a lot of verses here, so I want to go through them somewhat quickly. The subpoint under here, we've got spiritual death and then eternal death. This is the second death. And when I was writing an email to this gentleman, he said, well, why do I still die? It's like, well, when he says, should not perish, but have everlasting life, we're talking about life with God forever. There are only a certain group of people who will experience a second death, a second separation, and those are the people who die without Jesus. And at the great white throne judgment, they will be judged, they will receive according to their works, and they will depart, they will be separated, the second death. And the death, excuse me, a verse up here, Revelation 20, 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's why Hebrews 9, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. All of us in here, and, and, unless the rapture were to happen, we're going to experience death. Only once, though, praise God, we won't have to experience the second death. 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1 and verse 7, 8, and 9. And to you who, were, who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to obey the gospel? Believe it. Believe it. And we know from Romans 4 that is not a work. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Now, you can see here, this is not complete, all of a sudden, it's just like turning off the TV, no signal. Okay? We're talking about their destruction will last forever. Not that they will be in a destructed state forever, but that they will, they will be in torment for hell forever and ever and ever. That is the separation, as you can see here, everlasting destruct, uh, destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Puts a lot of perspective on things. A lot of perspective on things. Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Again, proof text there for the second separation, where the soul will continue, but it will be an everlasting destruction. So it's more than just saying, uh, I'll figure it out later on in life. You don't know what later on in life is. You may be on the last day of life tonight. Why not place your faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone? Amen? Why would we wait? Why would we wait? But people wait. Okay, the next point here is the phrase, Lost, John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in, my, uh, in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. You and I, when we believe on Jesus Christ for eternal life, we are kept by God, by Jesus, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And those who are not a part of the body of Christ, they are unbelievers, they're lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And there's a debate on what that means there. And son, the, the son of perdition, some think that means uh, Judas. Some think that means the Antichrist. I'm not here to answer that question tonight. But the only other place where that's used in scripture there is in 2 Thessalonians 2, where it talks about the son of perdition. But it's important to understand here, a person is also, as, as a part of the penalty, they're lost. Not as in God lost them but they wander. Is that not a perfect description 
of the lost man? They're lost. They have not found their Creator. Also, just as a side note, God has, He's the Creator of everyone. But He's not the Father of everyone. That's an important distinction to make. You may hear that. Those are not to be interchanged. He's not going to send His children to everlasting destruction. And that applies to a lot of different um, incorrect doctrinal positions. The third one here is condemned. John 3.18. Love this verse. John 3.16 is not the only one. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not... And look, at, look how simple this is. I know we're talking about sin and the penalty of sin, but just look how simple this is. Why are they condemned already? They didn't believe. That's the problem. I'm not trying to get someone to live a better life for salvation. You just simply have to believe what Jesus said about you and what he did for you. Isn't that wonderful? But it's also tragic in that there will be people who remain condemned because they simply have not believed. But condemnation is also a penalty of sin. Number four here is guilt. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. I want to just shoot very straight with you here. It's very concerning to me. Extremely concerning to see some of the things that are coming out of our leaders' mouths in regards to abortion. I read a tweet that said, the right to abortion is sacred. That burns me. It's just, it's very painful. It's a very painful thing. What are we saying there? I was also disturbed to see the president release a memo or something from the White House where he stood up for this right to take the life of those who are yet to be born. I get chills even thinking about it now. Judgment will come upon this nation. I believe that. I don't think that's a political statement either. But it is just chilling to see there's no guilt. There's no guilt. And I know people that have gone, th- that, that have gone through with abortion and they regret it. And I'm not here to judge that person. I want that person to believe. But let me tell you, to stand up for it, to advocate for it, there's no guilt in people's eyes. But they're talking. And every day, I, I posted this, I rarely ever post on news articles. I just said one thing, God will have the final word. Every mouth will be stopped, because you're hearing a lot of stuff, not just about abortion, but just in general on, on anything. It's hard to have a conversation with people because they are ready, they're locked and loaded. They're, how about this? How about this? They call you a racist, they call you a sexist, they call you anti-woman, all these different things, and they lump you into one category, but every mouth one day will be stopped. And you and I have to be wise to look past the hate that they throw and see there's a soul there that's condemned if they have not believed. And if it's a believer, there's a soul there that is out of proper proper fellowship with the Lord. Let's not be careful that we are a part of the problem. We want to win the soul, not the argument. But boy, there's a lot of talking going on, and you're hearing it now. That leak of the Supreme Court's uh, deliberation or notes on it, unprecedented. I, that, that I think that was on purpose. It's chaos right now. In some of these places, you look, there were people smashing cop cars. Cops have nothing to do with that law. It's, it's coming. What does that have to do with guilt? There's a lot of people who have removed that guilt. They have seared their conscience with a hot iron because of sin. But there will be one day where every mouth is stopped. But guilt is a part also of the penalty of sin. Perdition here, which means destruction. Uh, Philippians 1, 27 and 28 says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That, that, that is exactly what we just said about speak about the gospel. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in, in one spirit, with one mind striving together for what? 
the faith of the gospel. We have the best message in all the world. Believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you will receive as a free gift everlasting life. That's what we need to be about. People should be able to look at our lives and see the gospel. And not only that, but then hear it come out of our own mouths. That's what we should be striving for. The addictions ministry is to strive for people to hear the gospel. (laughs) Ranch, Awana, Sunday school, the Mother's Day breakfast, the Memorial Day picnic, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. I like that I'm a simple person. That's easy. (laughs) I'll just stick to the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, destruction, but to you of salvation and that of God. Number six here, and we're coming to a close, punishment. Matthew 25, 26. His Lord's answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest, uh, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered together where I have not strawed. I think I, that was the wrong verse. I might have given you the wrong verse there, Trent. It might have been, I'm not sure. Okay, here we go. This one is correct. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The other verse that was going to show there was going to demonstrate punishment, eternal punishment for the unbeliever. And here, the discipline, the loving correction, look at the difference here, chasteneth, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Just because you're born again doesn't mean that you will be free of correction. Now, it won't be out of wrath and anger, but it will be out of a righteous and holy love. Okay? And then the last one here is eternal everlasting. And one of the verses we already looked at is in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. It highlights this well. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? And then Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. This is probably uh, one of the scariest verses in the book of Revelation. The smoke of their torment will ascend up forever. That's a scary picture. We've been able to see some crazy things with CGI nowadays. They can really make anything look like anything. You just get a green screen and you can see some stuff like, wow, you're zooming somewhere or whatever. I don't even think today's technology is going to be able to capture what that scene is like. I also think, too, that they will be there in conscious torment, but you and I will will remember them no more. Can you imagine the people that will be in hell one day? Forgotten? Remembered by themselves? In conscious torment? This is why we need to line up on the gospel. You remember that when you were a kid in uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, when you would go different places and you hear the teacher say, line up! And you would all line up, get in line, and you'd go right to the destination. You'd follow the teachers like little chickens. You know? How chaotic it would be if the first graders ran around to do their own thing. Right? You know what that looks like. It's called the Scholastic Book Fair. Okay? That's where the kids ran around. But everybody got in line and listened to the teacher and went forward. We need to do the same thing. Get in line on the gospel and go out and reach people. The study of sin should bring us to two conclusions. Number one, that we are separated from God. And number two, that Jesus took our place. We should believe on Him. When you invite somebody to church, that's an opportunity. When you pray with somebody, that's an opportunity. When you pass out a track, that's an opportunity. I I had an opportunity this past Sunday night. In in our family, there's someone who's passing away, and I was asked to go over to the home and pray. I prayed in in the house, had everybody gathered together, and I gave a very clear explanation of what the gospel is. Because I knew this may be the only time that these individuals may hear the gospel presented clearly, and they're in a very difficult position. They, this may be one of the only times that they'll listen. 
Shouldn't just go in there and pray for peace and make everybody feel good. I gave the gospel to begin with, gave the gospel in the prayer, and told anybody to reach out. And I, I have no problem telling people, if you need help, call me. We'll set up some prayer, all these different things. Because people have a different idea of what a pastor is nowadays. Okay? I don't think a lot of people think a pastor is going to come and force their beliefs on them. And that's not what I'm going to do either. But if I can get my foot into the door with a gospel conversation by praying with somebody, I'm going to be there. And we've got to be ready for that. You know? So I hope this study has been beneficial. It's been five parts. Well, actually, I think it may be six. I might, my numbering might be off here. But you can go ahead and uh, close your Bibles. I'm going to give the gospel message here. John 3.16 illustrated. This is sin. You, this is you and me. This will represent Jesus Christ just for the sake of the illustration. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You're a sinner. Your sin separates you from God. You cannot earn eternal life regardless of what someone may tell you. Ephesians tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, not of works lest any man should boast. You can receive eternal life by believing on Jesus Christ who took your place. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the fun begins. Now the opportunities open up. You can share this message with other people. You can discipline yourself by walking in the Spirit and not walking in the flesh. God will bless you and put you in front of more opportunities the more obedient that you are. Look at Paul's life. Look at how many people he reached. God used him to write a majority of the New Testament. You read his account in Acts chapter 9 and when he speaks before Agrippa as well. <sighs> Chilling stuff, man. Chilling stuff. Exciting too that you and I can be used in the same way. But if you have not believed on Jesus Christ, there's some serious consequences that are coming your way. And I would not wait. If you need to reach out, if you're watching on the internet, reach out. We'll get someone to help you. I, I will do that myself. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity to get saved today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? For those that are watching on the internet, if you would... Reach out if you have questions. We would appreciate that. For those here in the audience, I pray this study has been a blessing to you. I pray that you will learn from it, properly apply these things to your lives, and that you will be of one mind concerning the gospel. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to teach this evening. I, I pray, Lord, that we can be disciplined, that we have the strength that is necessary to be disciplined. I pray for those who will be coming into our ministry over the next year because of different programs like ESL and uh, Simple Steps. We just thank you, Lord, that there's an opportunity to do those things. In Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.